Hey everybody, Thomas here. And today we're gonna go over why the Timber King 2020 or Timber King 2000 mill is the best mill in the market. There's a lot of reasons why, but I'm gonna go over the reasons why I think it's the best. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm also gonna come up with a video here pretty soon that's gonna go over all the different types of sawmills that are out there and what I consider the best sawmill at each of those levels. So there's gonna be like an entry level where it's like sawmills below $10,000. Then it's gonna be like a hobbyist level where say it's you know maybe up to $15,000. Then kind of an intermediate level with some simple or basic hydraulics up to, I don't know, maybe 30,000 or, or, or something like that. And then you start getting into your fully hydraulic sawmills such as this. Um, and then there will be a, a level that's actually above this where it's like your fully hydraulic sawmills, but they're more of a, a commercial theme to them. But, you know, in my opinion, this is the greatest sawmill across all levels because it can do everything. And we're going to talk about why. Also, two other things I want you to check out if you're subscribed to the channel or if you've seen some videos where I have my buddy Mr. Robert in there or Mr. Neil in there, please go check out their channels. Um, they've both created channels here recently. A few of my friends have been doing this. Uh, Mr. Craig out there in Utah, he created uh, his YouTube channel, The Kilted Sawyer. So very excited about seeing him out there and him with his two sawmills. He had an LT40 and LT50. But Mr. Neil down there in Mississippi, he actually has a 1600 mil, but we saw something pop on the Facebook group. And I said, Neil, if you don't get this, I'm going to see if I can go get it. Well, long story short, he went down to uh, the southern central portion of Florida and picked up a Timber King 2020 with a diesel just like this. So he too will also be able to talk to the same kind of things I'm going to talk to. Um, so yeah, and also his 1600 mil will be for sale. And then also Mr. Robert and his son Howard, they have created, um, it's like no, never a dull moment, moment with Mr. Robert and Howard, but they go over saw blades, they go over farm life, they go over stories. And they go over lies and they go over all sorts of fun stuff like that. And if you've seen any of my videos, we're dealing with the sharpening stuff. That's Mr. Robert. Uh, he, I, I consider him like a second father. Um, he is a fantastic individual and, and I'm so happy to see him with this YouTube channel because there's a lot of knowledge and there's a lot of bullshit in that individual, but it's, it's a lot of fun too. It's a lot of fun. So, all right, let's talk about this sawmill. So I put all my hydraulics up and everything because these are very critical. If you are looking for a, the tank of sawmills, this is it. It's got a four post design. It will cut wide. Pretty much everything on this sawmill is standard. There's only a few extra options you can get in addition to what you see here. And there's not many. From the get go, you are getting everything you could possibly want and to start a business with right here. So I've talked about this many times before. There's no particular order, but I'll, I'll really highlight my things that I say are my favorite. One of which are these vertical log stops. You have four vertical log stops. They're approximately 19 and a half inches above the deck. So they are more than enough support for any kind of log that you'll have out there. And these suckers are thick. These are solid steel. Um, that's probably what, inch and a half by two. That's like a, a bar of steel there. You've got a chain on there that goes through a couple of different pulleys down there, or a sprocket, excuse me. It goes down this long shaft right here, and it goes all the way back to a hydraulic motor. That hydraulic motor is right there. That allows you for vertical log stops up and down. And the reason why that is extremely important is anyone who's ever had, um, you know, a 1600 or below on Timber King, or if you've had a wood miser, uh, LT40 and below, or if you've had a Cook's mill, like a Cook's MP32, they have the stops that are at a diagonal. Sorry, I'm going to get my... They're at a diagonal like this, and you rotate them up to hold the log, and you change the angle based on how far you're down, how far down you're cutting. And that's all fine and dandy if you're only going to cut, like, straight as can be telephone pole pine logs. But if you start dealing with like slabs I have over there, the crooked stuff, the stuff that has knots, the stuff that has, you know, anything that can catch on something that's going down in a forward direction. Because what it'll do is it'll go down and you'll hit like a knot and then you'll roll that log. Or you'll try to bring it up and then you'll turn the log. There's all sorts of things. In my opinion, if you're going to have a business, you got to have a sawmill with vertical stops. 
I, I've run all different types of sawmills, and I will never buy another sawmill again that does not have vertical stops, unless I'm I, I'm looking for a small saw ah, small sawmill because maybe I couldn't use a large one. But other than that, you got to have vertical stops if you're going to do a business that deals with this. Okay, another thing, the Turner. This Turner right here is a beast. I mean, this thing. I mean, it's 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 like tank treads. This these are this is a huge chain right here. You've got these steel blocks that are on that. This will turn a log, and you can see it says do not overload the deck. It's got a five thousand pound limit down there. Um, I have not on this mill, but on my two thousand mill that I had prior to this, I have put logs on the mill that were in the neighborhood of forty six hundred pounds. This turner has no problem turning it. You've got this hydraulic motor down here tied up to this massive sprocket. I mean, look at that sprocket there. It's a massive thing. You've got this huge chain. You've got a tensioner system here. This is also a great design. It's not straight out and everything. It allows for some cantonary in that chain. Now, I can't push it down right now, but there is some sag. And as you can see, they have this beefed up steel plate here in the bottom. You want that sag in there because that allows you to grip that log, hug that log, and turn it. If you had just a straight bar, which I've seen on some mills and everything, it'll do it, but it, sometimes a log will do some funny stuff on you. This right here allows you to hug it. Now with these big blocks on here, so yes, these will grab, grab into your wood and turn it, and you'll see there are some pieces of wood. I'm looking right now if I see any. I don't see any right now, but you can actually mar up a log with this. Uh, this thing's got so much power, but you can put little, you know, teeth marks and, and grab marks in there when you're turning a log. Um, but, you know, you just have to use some caution if you're getting to a situation like that, if you don't want a log to have any marred up marks on it, but you can also be gentle with this. I use this often to, if I, say I have a cant and I turned it over and that cant isn't quite up against the log stops, but I don't want to use my log dog yet, you can actually grab with those blocks there and scoot your log over. Or maybe I'm just trying to just tweak the log a little bit, move it just a little bit. You can do this up and down. And when you really get good with the hydraulics, you can use the turner in conjunction with other pieces and parts or the up and down motion and you can gently lay a log over or you can lay a log over hard. But again, there is some finesse that does come with this because it is a hydraulic system and yeah you also have this large ram here in the bottom and if i have a super long log say i'm cutting something that's 20 foot long i might use my log dog there but i can also pin a log with this or say you have a log on there that is you know you're at the capabilities of this sawmill 39 inch in diameter i have put logs like that on my other sawmill you cannot grab it with your log dog however you can grab it and secure it with your log turner so there are multiple functions you can do with that turner it's a fantastic, um, you know, turner. I, again, if you are going to run a business and if you're going to be doing this, you know, trying to put out a lot of product and everything, you definitely want some hydraulics to assist you. A log turner is a, is a must. And there's a lot of different types out there. Um, there's mechanical turners that you can do it with a, you know, a, a geared you know, turnover system. I've seen turners where people use uh, some kind of chain system and they wrap it around and it pulls over with a winch. Uh, I've seen the claw that they have on Wood Miser, and I've seen these. In my opinion, this is probably one of the best ones out there. Okay, also, we have these tow boards. They got a forward and aft tow board and everything. And as you can see, there's a hydraulic ram underneath to lift up and down. And this is a new design. On my 2000, it actually had a different design. It would not lift up as high as this. These lift up about four inches. So as you see, you're about four inches above the deck there, and there are rollers on here. So what that means, there's a couple things you can do. Say you have a long log on here and you're towards the maximum, either you need to, be able to move the log forward or aft. You could use these tow boards to lift the log up and you can easily push the log because these are, these are on like roller bearings. You could easily push the log forward or aft. You may have a log that has a large bell in it. And that's one reason why a lot of people use tow boards and everything. Say you have a large bell on, on one side or the other, you can use these to kind of balance out the log to make sure you're making the most efficient cuts and you're not wasting material. If you have a large bell on there, your first cut might be really deep. You might be skimming on this side and, and it, it just throws everything off. These allow you to make your cuts a little more efficiently. 
And the other thing is also, if you're like me, I don't like to use a drag back system. This sawmill does have that, but I don't really like to use one, nor am I set up for one. You can use this at the very end to completely lift your log up, and then you can uh, take everything off the forks easily and not have to hit anything. So that's pretty nice. Um, there's also a few things. Uh, I've used them just here and there. Say if you're turning a, a, a cant over and you have a lot of sawdust on the deck. So say, you know, I had all this sawdust built up on the deck right here. And just a little bit of sawdust built up like that can cause your cants to be a little bit out. If I use one of these tow boards here to lift up, I can easily get underneath it and hurt it or I won't hurt my hand or anything. That's pine sap on there. Fun, fun. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a way to easily clear the bunks without running into the situation where you could risk hurting your hand or something like that. So again, I like them. I use them a lot, but not as much as uh, some other folks. It just depends on what I'm cutting because I cut a lot of slabs. Really on slab stuff, I don't really use them too much, but if I'm cutting dimensional lumber, most definitely will use them. Okay, your log dog. I do like this design a lot. There are a few things that I'll tell people to watch out for on it, but overall, this is a great design. Um, it does not lift up that much. This is all you got. So you've probably got six inches above the deck, um, which is okay because in many situations, that's all you need. There are a few times where I can't use this and I'll use my log turner as stated, but again, just something to take in consideration. This does have a sharp edge on there and this does have a lot of hydraulic pressure and I'll show how it does that, but that sharp edge right there, it will definitely, you can use that to press into a log and she'll hold it. You do have a ram here. Now I've seen these on other sawmills and everything and they just use the ram. If you're just using the ram, you've got some play that occurs in there. Well, in order to take some of that play out, they, they did a pretty cool thing. This right here looks to be the same type of material that's say off a 1600 as one of their um, uh, log stops. It just looks like that's about uh, three quarters of an inch by two inches, and it seems like the same material. But they made this track that allows it to slide up and down, but that gives it some support so you're not putting all that strain on your hydraulic uh, ram that comes out here. But you can see there is some movement in there, not much, but uh, that's you know more than ample. Also, another great thing is this is hydraulically up and down as well as in and out. I use this oftentimes right here. Say you have a cant and your cant is slightly off where you don't have it exactly squared up. You can use this. You can use this to push into the log a little bit. So it gives you control of one side and you can pull it down or pull it up just a little bit, just in order to straighten your cant up. I use that technique a lot because with these log stops, there is some play in those. So you can see there is play in there. Down here below, you have your um, you know, a, a bolt and nut combination, and you can use that to straighten those up so that they're 90 degrees always uh, from the bunk. However, if you're running a lot of big oak logs, say you're putting a lot of 30 inch plus oak logs, over time, those can get out of true. I don't necessarily true them in all the time because I have my log turner, or my, excuse me, my log dog. That log dog allows me to do a little bit of fine tuning and you know, just tweak that can just enough to get it where she's nice and squared up. It's just something that I've done over the years because you can just sit there and drive yourself crazy trying to keep a heavy piece of machinery in very, very tight tolerances, or you can use the machinery <laughs> with the hydraulics and all the help that's there to make it uh, pretty dang close. Uh, we do specialize in rough cut lumber. Uh, there's always a finished work that goes into it afterwards, but again, there's a lot of tricks you can do, and I'll talk about that in some future videos. Okay, the way that it goes in and out, there's a chain system on the bottom down there. That chain system on the bottom has a sprocket, which is hooked up to this hydraulic motor right here. And that sprocket will turn left or right based on the controls you give it and everything. So it just travels on this chain. This chain here is pretty tight, but here is a criticism. Let's see if I can get down there and show you. Okay, so you've got this nut there, or bolt. You've got another one at the top up there, and you've got the other ones on the other side. Over time, since this piece right here is under a lot of stress, you got stresses left and right, you got stresses up and down, it puts a lot of movement into that hydraulic motor. That hydraulic motor and this whole assembly can move around a lot. What you need to do is make sure you're checking those 
They do have, they're, they're short little bolts. They can probably be a, a quarter inch or so longer and you might want to put some Loctite on them if you ever had to take them off. They have a washer, they have a lock ring, and of course you have the bolt that goes through. I have seen those back out. Almost every single Timber King sawmill that has upwards of 300 hours on it, odds are if you've never checked those, they're probably loose or you may even be missing one. My buddy Jack, when we went to go look at his one day, he had three out of the four. But that's just something to look into. I think he said he increased the bolt size just slightly. Just a little critique and everything, but nothing major. Also, when this goes in and out, you've got these, I call them Teflon. I don't know what they call these, but I'm going to say they're little, these little Teflon pieces, whatever you want to call it. These are pretty stout. Sun does not like these. If you, get a, if you leave your mill out in the sun all the time, first off, that's rough on the equipment. Um, if you're doing that... Eventually, you should, you know, you have a sawmill, you should hopefully build your own building. But if you're going to leave it outside, make sure you're putting automatic transmission fluid on everything. That's how I keep these chains and stuff from rusting. But uh, just note that these, I call them Teflon pieces, like I said, they can start to get really white, get really brittle, and start to fall apart on you over time. Also, I like to try to keep this clean. You know, you can't always do that when you're running, but you can see over time it'll start to wear in here because they just kind of slide across here. And I add a little bit of tough or uh, ATF to that automatic transmission fluid as well. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about these right here, the loading arms. Something I don't really use, but not everybody has a tractor that can handle every single log. Or not everybody, like say they're on the road cutting and everything. Having these loading arms allows you to load logs. You might have someone... Uh, you go to their job site and everything, they don't have a tractor, and you don't have enough vehicles or time to bring your tractor, but you still want to cut their jobs. If you have a, you know, all your logs set up out here in front of this thing, if you have a good cant hook, you can just continue to roll those up there and uh, make like a little, you know, assembly line system, if you will. Roll them on there and use this to load a log on there. They work great. Um, I have tested them out, and on my dad's sawmill, we have maxed them out what i mean by max them out is based on their orientation and they can be moved as you can see there's another you know piece uh, lifting point right here but anyways um we got to a situation where we put a 25 foot log on his sawmill and it was lifting up on this side because there was too much towards the front of the, of the sawmill and it was uh, you know we had to use the tractors what i'm trying to say but again if there are extensions and stuff you can get and they do allow you to move the arms around. Okay, another little critique since I'm now talking about that, the tow boards. So right now you see the tow boards, if you are cutting eight foot logs, essentially it's three foot between the bunks. So eight foot is just past the tow board on this side and just past the tow board on that side. But if you're cutting, and also eight foot allows you to get three points of contacts on those uh, log stops. And everyone's like, why are there three there? Nothing there and just a gap down there. Well, that's because a lot of people are mostly cutting in the 8 to 10 foot range. Maybe it's a little bit longer stuff and everything. But really you don't need that long one down there unless you're cutting 18, 20 foot long. And really, based on where your clamping system is, you only need to get contact on these two. So 3 foot long is about the shortest log you can cut. And you need to make sure you use this one to pin it. But if you're cutting a log that is a, you know shorter than three bunks or whatever you won't really be able to use this in order to use a log turner you need to have contact on uh, three of those points there so that's why the orientation is the way it is and that's why there's a gap there because you could put one there but it's really not going to do anything for you in fact it might actually based on if you're cutting some 12 foot logs with a bell it could cause uh, some more issues for you also stainless steel bunks <laughs> or caps on the bunks excuse me the fact that these come with caps on the bunks is a plus I would never buy a sawmill, uh, knowing what I know now and everything, without stainless steel bunks. And anyone who's ever dealt with woods that are high in tannic acid, black walnut, oak, um, stuff like that, if you touch metal that is, uh, say, like bare steel and everything, you will almost instantly get blue lines and such on your wood. Uh, there's a reaction that happens between the tannic acid of the wood and the metal and just a short period of time So if, even if I was to lay some boards up against this railing right here where there's some exposed metal It would uh, leave me a nice 
black or purple spot there. That's also a good indication that you have um, metal in your wood. If you ever see a log that has a blue or black spot on it, uh, make sure you check it over quite well because there's most likely metal in it. But again, stainless steel caps on your bunks, they're great. Uh, and the way that they, they do this here, they don't have to cover the whole bunk. They just cover where the wood's going to be. And it allows them to be uh, replaceable. So if you ever got to a situation where you somehow managed to, to bend one of these up, or maybe you bust that rivet out or something like that, you can go ahead and order new of these. It's a pretty standard size and just pop it on there. Okay. Um, what have we not talked about out here on the on the... The actual frame itself is a high quality frame. I like the box uh, tubing, if you will, like the, the thickness of the metal and everything. It, it's pretty amazing that they use, I think this is a, it's probably like a two by six box tubing right there. That's pretty thick as you can see. Then they got like a quarter inch plate on top of that. And they got the rail on top of there and you have these um, chains here and everything. Uh, the actual, mechanism for driving the sawmill back and forth and everything there's a hydraulic motor does that uh, the only thing on on any four post head like this or any head that has you know the two rail systems and there's two chains if you ever get the timing off of those two chains and i'll show you on the back and everything meaning if you have one say you've got uh, sprockets on the back and everything if one sprocket is one chain link in front of the other or one chain link behind you will definitely notice that because you'll get some weird wobble or shimmy of your saw head left to right um, that's about the only draw that I know of when you have a system that's like this on a wood miser. You don't have that because I say on a wood miser on a wood miser LT 70 and below, you don't see that, um, on their cantilever heads because they only drive on one side. And this, this side here is of course, uh, not making any contact with the rail or anything, but there's some differences there. A four post head. I'm very much a big fan of. Okay. Now let's go over here to the actual saw head itself. Um, I've got this thing down, so just to show you a few things on it. First things first, when you are at its lowest, so I've got the saw blade one inch above the deck. And as you can see, even though I'm one inch above the deck, I've got clearance over my bunk stop there. I still have, I don't know, it's at least uh, a quarter inch or more of clearance there. They do give you these guide rollers on here. I like them that they're greasable and everything. Um, I know some people who do not run greasable ones. I know some people who run greasable ones. Uh, over time, I don't care what kind you're running, because we're dealing with wood that has you know high antannic acids and we're dealing with heat and we're dealing with spinning and high speeds because your blade's traveling about 55 miles an hour as it goes through there, you will have to change out bearings. But I don't think it gets any easier than this. I mean, I think they're all about the same to tell you the truth. But, uh, you're able to grease them easily. Also, if you take this nut off right here, you can slide that whole bearing assembly off, pop out the bearings that are in there, go to your auto parts store, get new ones. Yeah, you know, wham, bam, you're, you're done. It's awesome. But yeah, I like that design. Also, um, very easy to adjust. You've got a lot of different adjustment areas, uh, these bolts and everything to help you get your alignments or anything. Very easy to do. One thing on Timber King, anyone who runs a Timber King, you know you have this yellow tray right here. This yellow tray is kind of for safety. But one thing I'll say, the only way you can take a blade off is if you move your movable guide roller all the way in. Move it all the way in because it allows you to get past this notch section right here. So you see how it's notched out right there? And that allows you to slide the blade on and off. Again, that is a safety. They have their owners of safety. I also know some folks who maybe say cut that yellow thing back a little bit so you can change out a blade, I don't know, like anywhere. <laughs> but again, that's a safety feature and that's just something that's on there. Also, uh, most all of your LT70s and below and stuff like that, most all of your sawmills on Woodmiser, Timber King, I'm trying to think, Cooks might even run a different one. But anyways, pretty standard size. I believe these are... Uh, you know, I, I said pretty standard size. I don't remember the exact size. These are 18 or 19 inch diameter, whatever they are. I run a, there's a B56 belt currently on here because there's belts that are actually on the wheel. Uh, Cooks, of course, uses a, a full steel wheel that they put a crown into the actual wheel itself. They machine the surface. But Wood Miser and Tamer King, and there's a couple others, they run a belt system. So I've got a B56 belt on there right now. That's pretty tight. Um, whenever these belts wear out, and you can see there's there's plenty of life on these belts because 
You see that little gap there on top? Anyways, plenty of life on that. But when that belt wears out, I'll switch it out to a B57. You can totally run a B56 or B57. Either way, it's real easy. Uh, to remove, so say you had a bad bearing or something like that. My buddy Neil's had that before. Uh, you'll definitely know because there'll be some play and stuff in your wheel. And you'll probably see some black residue dust in this area right here. If you've got black residue dust, odds are your bearing inside is failing. You'll also have some reduced performance of the sawmill and you'll have extra noise. And of course, after this thing's not turning and the sawmill's off, you put your hand on there, you'll feel some heat. But again, really accessible, easy to work on. These sawmills are made to be easily worked on and easily find parts for because if you had to change out the bearing for this, it's a simple automotive bearing that you can get at any of your auto parts store. So again, I like that there's no you know, super proprietary parts and stuff like that when it comes to doing the mechanical maintenance on the sawmill. All right, we're gonna show you something here then we're gonna go to the back. See that right there? You actually have two hydraulic pumps that are connected to one shaft. Now those run off of, there's a pulley, I can't get my phone to focus, but behind the shroud right here, off the engine, there's a pulley that goes to the hydraulic motor right here. And of course, off the shroud, uh, there's the belt to the actual drive uh, pulley over there. But what this is saying, you've got one shaft that's, that pumps up hydraulics for two different hydraulic uh, 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 blocks back aft. So you got two, two pumps there, and those two pumps go to two independent uh, valve body sections here. So you've got you know, on, on this side right here, of course, your highest one, this is your cutting head forward and aft and everything. And then also on your 100 or, you know, completely opposite side would be your cutting head up and down. Those are your two most common functions that you're going to use. And that makes sense. The, the layout that they do on this is really easy. Now, I don't, once you start using this sawmill and everything or any sawmill that's got hydraulics, you really won't have to look at these. The only ones I have to look at is if I'm loading a log, because I never use a log loader or anything, I have to figure out, okay, which one do I grab? Um, but everything else on here and the tow boards. I'll say I don't use the tow boards, like I said, as often, but you're gonna be working the outside of the controls. So this lever and this lever. And then when you're turning your logs, you're gonna be using these two levers right here. And they make sense. So saw head forward and back and everything, that is on one set of hydraulics. My log stops, I don't wanna be operating my log stops while I'm moving the head forward and aft. So those are on a separate, or they're on the same bank so that it kind of limits you. You can do them both, but it will it'll split the power between the two. So in actuality, yeah, you'll only do one operation at a time per valve block. But the way they do this is awesome because again, log turner, I can use, I can lift up the turner on this side and I can turn it on this side. And I use those two in conjunction. Same thing with the cutting head. Once the cut's done, I'm usually still, um, you know, I lift the head up, so I'll, I'll lift up this, lo this lever right here, and then as I'm lifting up, I'll bring this back, and whenever I get back to it, whenever I want to start back into the log, if I'm not using my advanced set works, I'll go ahead and bring this down as well. So I, I like how they set up the hydraulics. They've got these gauges on here. Really, there's not a whole lot you can tell. You can tell if you're overpressurized, if you're pushing too hard and stuff like that, or if your hydraulics are cold, but there's not a whole lot. Also, with your valves, here and everything you also have kind of like this needle valve right here this allows you to you fully open this valve right here and then you control this right here so i'll be using this one with one hand this one with one hand as i go through my cuts i like the ability of doing that because otherwise if i was just using this to control my speed through it would be kind of jerky and if i ever let off so if i ever let off or say i coughed or something like that it would make the saw head jerk and you don't really want that so this allows you a little finer control and everything and make sure your con cut speed is consistent because consistent cut speed is um you know what you need to have good looking lumber then you've got of course your your clutch here it's electric clutch and everything standard clutch you can get at a lot of different places um again if you ever have clutch issues uh, you can buy them from timber king but i think you could also cross reference them it's similar to that clutch that you'd have say on a uh, lawnmower or such like that like a zero turn guide roller in and out so this guide roller in and out, I like this electric function right here. So that's the about the only electric motor that is on here. And the cool thing is, and we'll, we'll go up there and show you in a second, the way that is set up is really nice. And of course, on the diesel model, I've got my throttle right here. 
Uh, the throttle and the gas one, which I'm not a big fan of, I believe is up on the actual sawmill, if I'm not mistaken, or anyway, no, it, it's down here, but starting it uh, on the gas model separately. But the diesel one is nice because you have your little start system right here. We'll go ahead and crank her up. Very easy start system. I mean, now this is an older school design. I think the newer ones has a, uh, a little more fancy design, if you will. But really, this, this is the other big thing. Other than log stops, you want to have a, a uh, sawmill that has some kind of advanced set works. Timber King's basic set works or simple set works, I am not a big fan of. But their advanced set works, they got this right. And boy, I don't know. I've run a couple others out there. This is a good system. Now, I've done a whole lot of videos on this. I'm not going to show you how to do everything on here, but I'll just show you a quick few things. So right now, I am measuring from the bottom up. What I mean by that is all my cuts are going to be referenced off the bottom. But say if I want to, I don't care about my bottom cut, and I want to measure from the bottom down, then I go to this second button right here. This is like a preset two, or not? A, it's not even preset two, excuse me. It says alt mode right there. So I'm in alt mode, that measures, that changes the reference from what I'm uh, cutting. And I'll put a description to a video down below that goes over all the ins and outs of that. That's a pretty nice thing. Also, I can go through all my different presets. There's five presets. So with those presets in there, if it's something I'm cutting repeatedly out of a log, if I'm trying to get some you know, weird size, I don't know why I have so many sizes in here, but anyways, if I'm trying to get a couple different presets in there, uh, out of, or a couple different cuts on the log, I can use my presets to go to that quickly. Really easy to set this thing up and get it into calibration. Easy to set home. So right now she's at one inch and it's showing one inch, but if I set home, it pretty much sets my home position there. And if I bring the saw head up, I'll just show you just a few little options. So we want inch and a quarter. I set return. I do auto saw down. It'll get me onto the inch and a quarter, you know, essentially measurement system. Now I'm there at eight and three sixteenths. If I go down again, do auto saw down, it'll go down an inch and a quarter plus the thickness of my blade. So it does all that calculation for you. It's a great system. And as you can see, there's drag back set stuff you can set return you can do all your adjustments manual this is a manual uh, right here so you can press these buttons right here if you want to do things manually and if i'm ever bumping a log i'll or bump the saw head i'll just use the manual buttons there i know this is a long video but i really want to make sure people understand how awesome this sawmill is again with the the guide roller in and out on earlier models, they did not have a square tube like this. They actually used some round bar there, and there was some movement on there. didn't really care for that, um, but I do like the square tube design. Also, again, your blade tensioner. So as you can see, it's, it's a very simple spring system with a little hydraulic gauge up there that tells you everything. Uh, your saw head up and down, there's a ram that is in this tube right here. And that ram is hooked up to these chains, of course, right here. And these chains are hooked up to the left and right side of the sawmill. Um, if you ever get into a situation where these are not quite lifting the, the same everything, you go to the top of the sawmill and you can kind of see that little silver head up there allows you to adjust it. There's a lot of different adjustment points on here, really easy to get to. Also throughout the sawmill, they do take the user in mind for most things for when it comes to maintenance not all things but for most things but you have the ability to you know grease all your fittings you get zerk fittings all throughout the sawmill and everything and again i like to spray everything with automatic transmission fluid the hydraulic sump if you will sorry my dog barking annie come over here girl come here um, I like how they have the hydraulic uh, filter on there and everything, and it gives you a little indicator. It tells you if you've got uh, you know, issues or you're restricting due to uh, debris and stuff in there. Also, a neat little add is they have a temperature gauge on there, as well as they have a drain port right here, which is not going to drain on anything. And there's a fill port up on top there. So very easy, great design for that. Now let's talk about a design that is not that great. And it's really not that big of a deal, but it is kind of a pain in the butt. So you see that right there? Well, if you look right here, if you were ever to change the oil on this sawmill, 
it gets everywhere and it gets all over that plate and everything it's an absolute pain in the butt but again i'm going to add in a little extension onto there so no harm no foul and again the diesel engine is probably the best upgrade you can do um yes there is the gas model and it's got a ton of power in fact it has more horsepower than this this has been detuned if you will i say detuned and i'll talk about that here in a second this has got a 24.8 or 24.9 um diesel engine on here now this diesel engine is actually an older 32 horse diesel engine and there's some things you could do to it i'm just saying you could you could bring it back up to 32 horsepower but you know to tell you the truth at 24 horsepower let me pause real quick and make that dog stop okay maybe she'll stop now <laughs> hound dog she don't get her way she barks at it okay so the diesel engine again this is a they, they detuned it down to 24 0.8 or 0.9 horsepower whatever i'm not really that worried about it um this is a v1505 and if you know anything about a kubota diesel engine it's a four-cylinder diesel engine v the denotion the nomenclature v in japan actually means four so not using the roman numerals and everything but v means four 1505 that denotes the number of cubic centimeters so it's a 15 100 cc and a d means it's a naturally aspirated diesel engine now if that had a t at the end of course it'd be turbo and the turbo would be pumping out a little more but it runs a different set of injectors and stuff like that uh, you do have a fuel filter that's on the diesel itself as well as you have the inline filter and i did try to put some other different uh, filter system on there and that did not work out for me but <laughs> that's for another video um but yeah, very easy to work on this diesel engine, and it's a diesel engine that's been around for a long time. Uh, yes, this is an expensive diesel engine upgrade. Uh, it used to be about $8,000 for this upgrade. Now I think they're closer to $10,000. This is an industrial Kubota diesel that comes from Japan, and there are issues with uh, all the uh, you know delays to the supply chains and stuff like that. It has taken a while to get these engines, but these are great engines. They are time-tested and they are very well proven and they're all mechanical so that's why i'm going to say yes even though we do own a timber king 2220 this is still the better engine in my opinion now my dad's sawmill and my sawmill down in tennessee that's a 2220 it has a essentially a 50 horse diesel on there it's got just buku amounts of power but it has things on there as well that i'm not really that big of a fan of it's got uh, a lot of uh, egr type stuff it's got a diesel particulate filter it's got an ecu it's got a crazy complex computer system that can track all maintenance and everything on the sawmill and that's all fine and dandy if you are looking for all that extra power and stuff like that but to tell you the truth this sawmill right here i can cut everything that my dad's sawmill can cut maybe a little bit slower but i can cut everything he can cut um with this you know half the power that he has um and i'm a lot more fuel efficient i'll say that too so that's why i'm saying even out of the larger models this is still my favorite um the one thing that i wish that i did have although i say i wish i had it but i don't ever use it uh would be a tandem axle my buddy mr gary did get the tandem axle upgrade you can you can add that to the sawmill as an upgrade um but you don't really need to the sawmill itself weighs 5500 pounds ish and I believe it's a 7,000 pound axle on there. So you have plenty of room in an axle. But if you're gonna be on the road a lot, if you're gonna be covering a lot of ground and everything, I've always just been of that mindset. I like an extra you know, set of tires there because if you have a blowout in this current situation, that could be bad. Imagine having a blowout in the sawmill. You have all these hydraulic lines and everything that are pretty low. That would make me a little bit nervous. But again, not a not a you know a killer a brain or a game changer or anything like that um it is just what it is the axles as you see they do have brakes and everything on them so that's a huge plus and this thing does come out fully loaded to tow it has a great towing mechanism um if you see this hole right here will match up to this bolt right here now it's i don't have the sawmill line for that so the saw head would be right here and it's a great system. It actually secures it down, uh, holds it in place and everything. You don't have to worry about the saw head rolling around. That's a huge plus. At, with, it, it's the best, you know, one of the best systems I've seen for holding a saw head in place while towing. So big plus on that. Another note, 
always turn this off when you're done. It'll uh, drain the battery down because it allows you to turn this on and off uh, with even with the sawmills off. Again, a feature that I don't use, but they do have is a drag bag system. It works great. I just I just don't care to use it. Personal preference. Okay, let's talk about some of the ads you can get. Um, so we've already talked about the tandem axle. Tandem axle is an upgrade you could get. Another thing that you could get would be a uh, debarker. The debarker, people often wonder, what the heck is this thing up here for? Well, that's for your debarker. I have seen a Timber King debarker. I've spoken to many people who have it, and most people probably take that debarker off. Not all, most. I am just not a big fan of debarkers because we already sharpen and set our own blades, so I'm not too concerned about that. It just, again, personal preference. Another thing that you could do is you could get a, I'll come around this side, you could get a hitch that is a breakaway hitch. So as of right now, I don't have a breakaway hitch and everything. My hitch is outside of my building. I don't really care about it. Um, get your little brake controller box and everything else. Uh, it's a two and, it's, it's large, and it's a two and a quarter inch ball, whatever. It's, it's the next size up from two, two inch ball. Um, there is a hitch, again, that, that detaches somewhere over here. It slides in and out and everything. So if you want to make sure this is going to fit into a building, because the sawmill is quite large, you might want to ask about, hey, can I get the removable tongue or, or what do they call that thing? Um, my buddy Gary has that. He likes it. I really don't care. I just keep a heavy-duty lock on there, and it's, yeah, not, not a big concern for me. Another thing is you can get an extension to the sawmill. So you have these points right here on both sides. There's a 12 foot extension that Timber King sells. If you are gonna get the 12 foot extension, I wanna say the price is, it's like 3,500 or whatever the price is because it's a frame, it's a 12 foot extension. But here's the thing that makes it where it's not the easiest to take down. Because this is a fully hydraulic mill, there's no electrics and everything, you have to extend your hydraulic lines. So there will be, now they do a pretty good job on their, their connection points or anything. There will be, I believe it's a set of quick disconnects that can go onto the sawmill, but you'll actually have to add on to your energy chain and to your hydraulic lines to allow it to do that extra 12 feet. Also, if you're doing that, you might get into a situation where you need to move your loading arms around as we've previously discussed. But again, I had to get this video out to show you why this sawmill is the best before i go into saying here's my rankings of all the sawmills i just wanted you to know there's so many things on the sawmill the vertical log stops is the number one thing that every sawmill that's going to do this as a business should have i'm not saying you have to have it's just something i think you should have because it, it'll just save you time you also need a reliable and powerful turner and you definitely want to have a log dog that can move in and out up up and down hydraulically and you really want to have your set works one thing about the set works again this is the only solenoid control valve that's on the sawmill there are other sawmill companies out there that use a lot of solenoid control valves i'm not a big fan of it this is the only one because for that up and down to work for the auto saw and the up and down you have to have this on here so it can stop it on there and i will say it is so accurate the the accuracy of this sawmill uh, with the uh, advanced set works is amazing. I, I am not disappointed. I am very happy with the way the set works works in the sawmill. All right, I'm also gonna put a link to my Timber King 2000 video, which I think I put out about two years ago. Pretty much saying the same things-ish. Um, but yeah, you just get so much at the model level it is, and it's all standard. Again, if you look at the stats or anything, this is the 2020. It'll do a, it can handle a 39 inch diameter log, 21 foot. Your max width of cut, meaning between the guide rollers, if you put that guide roller all the way back and everything, is 38 inches. And if you bring the saw head all the way up from the bunk to the blade, you have 36 inches. So you can do a 36 inch cut as your highest cut you can do on a log, but you still have. 16 inches above that 36 inches so you can put some crazy weird oblong logs in here because you have that all that room in there and you have again 38 inches wide to work with i you know i'm just blown away 
at this sawmill and what it has done for me. Uh, I've run many sawmills. We've owned eight sawmills. And even though we have the ones above this, and I run the ones, I've run a 2520 as well. I love this 2020 or a 2000. Again, that is the best. You're not going to change my mind. <laughs> um, but I just want to put it out there. So if someone else is looking for, you know, here's why I'm saying it's the best. And again, I'm not sponsored by anybody. I, I just love to do this. But we are going to be doing some more sawmill shows this year. And that'll give you the opportunity to come out and take a look at this. So, since we're on that topic, and if you stayed this long into the video, um, oh, contemplating right now, it's 2023, June 10th, 2023. So, if you're looking at this video and it's well past that date, I'm sorry. Uh, but again, we're looking at June 10th, 2023 in Tennessee. Uh, we're going to do a small get-together. It won't be a full-blown show, but it'll be an all-day event where, you know, we have people come out there and have a good time. More to follow. Uh, but again, I appreciate y'all watching this channel. I know this is a long video, but I just, I got to tell you, this is the best. I've run these uh, Timber King 2000 or 2020 now for almost four years, and I'm just blown away at how, how good it is. <laughs> All right, folks. Hope you enjoy this. We'll see you around. Thanks.